The impulse signal is also known as the Dirac delta function. Mathematically, it's given by um, the symbol delta t. Okay, um, it's also called the delta function. Um, but it can be thought of really as being a burst of energy, so something like a lightning bolt, um, so this sharp burst of energy. Um, so let's try to start off by sketching out a, a signal with a burst of energy. So I'm going to show amplitude A versus time T. And um, a signal that has a burst of energy will have a value of zero up to a certain point and then increase rapidly in energy or amplitude and then decrease back to zero. Okay. So this isn't an impulse but this represents something that has a burst of energy. Um, now to try and understand what the impulse is I'm just going to introduce a term. So um, I'm going to say that this pulse has a width or a duration of epsilon and an amplitude of 1 over epsilon. Okay. Um, I'm also just going to note that this burst of energy is centered at time t equal to 0. Okay. Um, but the area under this curve here, or under this function, will be equal to 1 because epsilon multiplied by 1 over epsilon will be a value of 1. Um, so I just might make a note of that up here. So the area is equal to 1. And if I was to call this function x of t, well then the integral of x of t between plus and minus infinity would also be equal to 1. Okay, so that's just re-emphasizing that point mathematically. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, let's consider what would happen if epsilon was reduced. So, if epsilon was reduced, this pulse or burst of energy would decrease in duration, get narrower, and increase in amplitude, get taller. Okay, so let's sketch that out. So if epsilon was to reduce, then we'd have a pulse that was shorter in duration but higher in amplitude. So something like that. Okay, go back to zero again. Okay. Now the area here under this curve here would be one because again this is a similar function. The amplitude will be 1 over epsilon, the width would be epsilon, so multiplying those two would give you a value of 1. Now, so this is a burst of energy that's shorter in duration but greater in amplitude. Now, what the direct delta function is, or the impulse signal is, is what's produced when epsilon is equal to 0. And when that happens, what we get is this pulse or burst of energy at zero up to time t equal to zero and then the amplitude would go up towards infinity. It wouldn't be infinity but it would go towards infinity. Now I can't show this on this graph and what the way an impulse is normally shown is shown as this line with an arrow which indicates that it goes towards infinity. And after time t equal to zero, the amplitude will be back to zero. Okay, so this blue signal here is really what the direct delta function is. Um, it's what we can think of it as this pulse um, of width epsilon and height one over epsilon, where epsilon goes to zero. Um, so the area, if I took the area under the curve of this blue signal, I took the integral delta t dt, that would be equal to 1. That's one of the key properties of the direct delta function. I'm just going to clear all that and just to 
reinforce those points. So if I was sketching out the direct delta function, it'd show amplitude against time. The amplitude would be zero up to time t equal to zero. And at the time t equal to zero, the amplitude goes up towards infinity. It's not equal to infinity. Um, it's really undefined. And we'll be back to, to uh, an amplitude of zero after time t equal to zero. So mathematically, delta t is equal to zero for all t not equal to zero. Okay. Um, the other key property of the direct delta function, or the input signal, is that the area under the curve between infinity and minus infinity, delta t dt, well that's equal to 1. Um, this is probably the most important thing here, this area. Um, and there's a couple of important consequences that should be noted as well. And this will be particularly important when it comes to trying to understand things like convolution. If I had, um, if I scaled the signal delta t by some scale or k, so say I said k delta t, so I multiplied delta t by some scale or k, well then if I took the area of k delta t, dt, if I took the integral of that, well that would be equal to k, because that would be k by the area of, or the integral of delta t dt, which is equal to k by 1, which is equal to k. Um, and that mightn't seem so important now, but when it comes to understanding things like convolution, um, that's an important back to note. Okay, so that's the introduction to the input signal. Um, in the next video, I'm going to take a look at uh, the input signal in the frequency domain, and what you'll see is that the input signal has a very useful property that the impulse in the frequency domain contains all frequencies. So we'll take a look at that in the next video, and you can see how that's used to determine the frequency response of systems. Okay, thanks for your attention.